Hello everyone and welcome to your first lecture. This is day one and I'm going to review the human body and orientation. So what you will need is the part of your manual that says day one, chapter one, the human body and orientation. And so what I do is I go through a slideshow um, and I have you just fill in blanks as we go. Filling in the blanks kind of helps you follow along and make sure that you're still staying focused and engaged in what we're looking at. Um, but I don't have you write down everything because that would take way too long. So with these lectures, they'll be anywhere between 30, 35. Uh, every, once, every, every once in a while, I may have one that lasts 40 minutes. It just depends on what we are looking at. But I'm trying to keep each one as close to 30 minutes as possible so you're not sitting and listening to me lecture. The thing is, is we have a lot to go over for each day. And so it might feel like I'm going really fast through some of this stuff, but please know that you can always pause, obviously, to write something down and each day you are not expected to memorize everything or even have everything completely processed because we are doing 18 weeks in a matter of three weeks each day the information I give you is usually what I would probably cover in the course of only one uh, in the course of one week so you're getting one week's worth of material in a day so it's gonna feel a little jam-packed but I think as we move along you'll start getting more comfortable with the uh, flow uh, how this is gonna go and you'll start getting more comfortable with maybe not having everything completely memorized because you do have this it's just a resource it's just an introduction. Um, it's just to expose you to all of the different vocabulary and all of the different topics. And then you use these notes to either do an activity or to take a concept check. So as we move along, you'll get more comfortable, but I am going to really um, try to get through this entire chapter, this introduction to anatomy in less than 35 minutes. So we're gonna talk just a little bit about structure and function. We're gonna go over the levels of organization, list the functions necessary for life, list the survival needs of the body. I'm gonna talk a little bit about homeostasis and explain its significance. And then we will cover some anatomical terms to describe the body. Then your activities for today is a drag and drop anatomical term activity, and then you're going to do a mouse dissection. All right, so it's important to know the difference between the words anatomy and physiology. So this class, I just say anatomy. Some are anatomy, but it's anatomy and physiology. <clears throat> anatomy is going to describe the structure, the relationship between body parts, and then physiology is what do those things do. So anatomy is the structure, structure, physiology is the function. And those two things are going to go hand in hand and they're going to complement each other because we have this thing or this saying down here, structure dictates function. So what the structure looks like, how it's formed, um, all of its characteristics are going to dictate what it does for that organism all right so it says what a structure can do depend on it depends on its form for an example the cells that line the lungs are going to be really flat and like disc shaped if you so if you looked at a picture and i know i should have a picture here but i'm just randomly coming up with this example if you look at a picture of the cells that line the lungs they are going to be really flat disc like why is that structure dictate its function how does that form determine what those cells are used for. Well, we know that your lungs are used for gas exchange. Bring in oxygen and you breathe out carbon dioxide. It's very convenient that the cells that line the lungs are flat and disc shaped so that oxygen and carbon dioxide can easily diffuse across. Another example would be a um, jackrabbit that lives in the hot desert. A jackrabbit that lives in the hot desert has really big, thin ears. And when I ask students, why does it have ears like this? A lot of them will say, oh, so it can hear really well and, and it can avoid predators. That's really not it. They have really big, thin ears so that heat 
in the blood will rise and their th the ears are full of capillaries the heat will rise and will evaporate out of their ears so it's um, it's actually a method of evaporative cooling so that's how the structure of the jackrabbit's ears fits its function all right levels of structural organization uh, normally in a in an ANP anatomy and physiology class we would talk about atoms and then compounds and all of those things we're going to talk a little bit about biochemistry in the cell but really what you need to know is that cells that come together to perform some kind of action um, make up a tissue so an example would be muscle tissue tissues make up organs so an example would be muscle tissue coming together to form the heart um, organs are going to work together to make organ systems and then organ systems are going to gather, work together to make an entire organism. And then you just have a picture and you can kind of follow it along here. Cool. So that's kind of a hierarchy of the structural organization and, and anat anatomy structural organization is what that would be. All right, I want to review all of the different organ systems. Um, we are going to cover a lot of these in this class, but I have decided to eliminate some of them. And uh, those decisions were either based on, I just didn't think it was part of the most interesting ones and or it's something that I cover in depth in my AP Bio class. And I do know some students taking anatomy are not gonna take AP Bio, but the majority are. And so that's how I base that decision. Um, I hated to leave any organ systems out, but it, I just didn't have a choice. With such a short period of time, I had to leave some out. So integumentary, integumentary system is going to be the hair, skin, and nails, and it's going to provide protection. Um, synthesizes vitamin D, houses pain and pressure receptors, sweat and oil glands. All right, that's integumentary. So you're going to fill in the blanks here. All right, and then we have skeletal system. Skeletal system, we are not going to go over. Um, the skeletal system is going to provide the framework for muscles. So skeletal system is actually really important in movement. Um, it's also important in blood cell formation, and bones are going to store minerals. So that's skeletal system. All right, muscular system, that is um, not something that we are we have had time, are going to have time to do. I do go over muscle contraction in AP Bio though, so if you're taking that class, you can look forward to that. Um, muscle system, muscular system, sorry, is going to um, allow manipulation of the environment, locomotion, locomotion and facial expression. And the one thing that I think surprises some people is that the muscles are involved in the production of heat. So whenever your body gets really cold and you shiver, your muscles are contracting and, um, providing heat for the body, which is pretty cool. All right, nervous system. Nervous system is one of my favorites, so we definitely are going to cover that. This is your fast acting control system. It's going to respond to stimuli from the environment or internal stimuli, and then it's going to send signals so that things are regulated um, in within the body it's going to I mean it does everything basically your brain and your spinal cord and your nerves are going to really control everything that goes on in your body so definitely an interesting one that we will go over uh, I also really really like the endocrine system the endocrine system consists of all of the glands that secrete hormones and so a hormone is going to be a chemical messenger that travels through the blood just a chemical messenger that travels through the blood. And when you think of hormone, you think of, oh, testosterone and estrogen, those are the hormones. Yes, those are the sex hormones, but you also have other hormones uh, like thyroid hormones. We'll talk about those. And you have insulin, which is released from the pancreas. And then you even have adrenaline. Adrenaline is considered a hormone also. So we'll talk about all of those. And I have a really interesting um, activity for you to do for endocrine system, kind of controversial. Um, it's called sex determination. It's about athletes and sex determination. And then it gets into kind of some of that other, some other stuff in uh, how um, sex determination may not actually be as black and white and cut and dry as we actually thought it was. If you will start looking at the DNA and the genetic makeup of certain people, it's fascinating. And I'm, I'm really um, excited about exposing you guys to this, um, this lesson that um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute is providing for students. So we'll get to that later though. Um, cardiovascular system is definitely one that we have to go over um, because it is so important because cardiovascular disease is one of the um, 
biggest disease uh, disease states. Cardiovascular disease is one of the um, most common diseases. Sorry, I can't get that out of adults um, ages you know 50 and up. So that's definitely a really important one for us to look at. And a lot of you are have chosen to dissect the pig heart. So I definitely want to make sure that we go over the parts of the heart. And so the cardiovascular system is for transport, transport of blood, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, and waste. So that's cardiovascular system. So we're going to spend two days on cardiovascular system. Uh, we're going to talk one day about blood vessels and blood, and then one day on just the heart and heart contraction. Heart contraction is actually pretty cool. It's not like regular muscle contraction. Okay, lymphatic system. This is a this is actually a circulatory system but it doesn't have anything to do with blood. This is your like your second circulatory system and what's going to circulate through it is called lymphatic fluid. Um, if you ever heard of having, you know, if you ever heard of your lymph nodes, you know you have lymph nodes in your throat, under your armpit, in your groin area, and lymphatic fluid is what's going to be stored and transported through um, the, the lymph nodes and the lymphatic vessels. And the, the bone marrow, thymus, and spleen are all going to play a part in that. And this is basically your immune system. It's your immune system, and it has to do with white blood cells. I chose to not cover that in uh, this class. I know that might kind of upset some people because you're like, oh, my gosh, we're dealing with coronavirus. Uh, I just kind of wanted to take a little break from the immune system and coronavirus for a little while. It might be kind of a selfish thing, but I do cover immune system very, very, very much in depth in uh, my AP bio class. And I love immune system. It's like, it's like war. It's so cool. And so um, I, I won't do it for this class, but um, if you take the other class, I'll do it then. All right, respiratory system is definitely one that we will go over. It um, obviously is going to involve breathing, the bringing in of oxygen and the releasing of carbon dioxide, so gas exchange. All right, digestive system is one that I think that you get um, a lot of exposure to in Ms. Nichols' life science class. If you took her life science class, I did decide to leave that one out um, just because it, it is pretty basic one that probably everyone is the most familiar with. Um, so breaking down food and absorbing nutrients into the blood is the digestive system. Urinary system is also known as the excretory system, and we are going to talk about the kidneys. Um, on day three, we're going to talk about the kidneys, and you're going to do a kidney simulation with simulated blood. If you've looked through your basket, you'll find the simulated blood. And so what the excretory or urinary system is for is releasing waste from the body and regulating blood balance. All right, and then finally, we have the reproductive system. We are going to tie reproductive system into endocrine. And I'm only really going to, I'm not going to talk about reproduction. I'm going to talk about the uh, reproductive hormones. All right, I got a little, a little off on my um, life functions for humans. I'm just going to go over this list really quick because most of you already know this. These are the eight uh, necessary life functions for humans. Maintaining boundaries inside and out, so keeping us safe, um, especially from pathogens. Movement, internal and external. Responding to changes internally or responding to changes externally so like responding when it gets too hot or when it gets too cold keeping that balance digestion um, breaking down food for absorption and ob obtaining energy and nutrients and minerals and things like that metabolism we must have a metabolism we metabolism isn't just the breaking down of food for energy and, and using energy metabolism this is the totality of all the chemical reactions in the body we must remove waste, and that's called excretion. We must reproduce uh, at the cellular level and at the organismal level. So our cells need to reproduce for growth and repair, and then our organism, our self, must reproduce so that we can keep our species alive and continuing on. We must grow, and that's it. Those are the eight necessary life functions for humans. Now I'm going to go over five survival needs. These kind of tie into necessary life functions. So these are the things that we need to survive. Nutrients, um, so this could be minerals, um, electrolytes, vitamins, and really what those do is those help stabilize enzymes so that metabolism can happen. So if you think of nutrients, why do I need a nutrients? Well, nutrients are the th healthy things in food that actually help aid in metabolism. 
We need oxygen. We need oxygen for cellular respiration to take place so that we can make ATP, which is the energy that is used for um, doing any kind of work, any process that occurs. For, for muscle contraction to occur, you have to have ATP. In order to have ATP, you have to have oxygen. Uh, we need water. Water is going to help with, um, obviously, to keep us hydrated, but it's going to help with chemical reactions as well. We have to maintain a normal body temperature. If we get out of body temperature range, then we can have issues with our enzymes. And then we must maintain a certain atmospheric pressure, not too high or not too low, or things will get um, very out of whack and out of balance. Take down those five things. If you need to pause, then go ahead and pause. But I am gonna go ahead and move on and talk about homeostasis. All right, so something that keeps us alive is this thing called homeostasis. And homeostasis is going to maintain a stable internal condition. So it's going to maintain equilibrium and balance. The way that homeostasis works is that a receptor is going to sense a change, okay? A receptor is going to sense a change. It could be a receptor um, anywhere on the outside or the inside of the body. That change is then going to send a signal to the control center and the control center is usually going to be the brain and the, is going to be the brain and the brain stem. The brain and the brain stem are then going to integrate that information and then send out a signal. How, how are we going to respond? So for an example, um, a receptor senses that you are cold. That gets sent to your brain your brain then sends a signal down to your muscles to shiver. Easy as that. There is this thing called negative feedback. Negative feedback is the process in which homeostasis occurs. So in a simple way, uh, a simple way to put this would be more gets you less and less gets you more. So if you get too hot, negative feedback causes your body to cool you down. If you get too cold, negative feedback causes your body to heat back up. It's just keeping it like in the middle of the road at a very um, specific balance it's called negative feedback. All right, breathing rate is involved in negative feedback and blood sugar levels. If your blood sugar gets too high, your body's going to do something to bring it back down. If your blood sugar gets too low, your body's going to do something to bring it back up. And it's going to main, maintain a very specific balance. So hopefully that kind of made sense. On the flip side of negative feedback, so negative feedback is the process by which homeostasis occurs. Positive feedback is going to increase a response. So positive feedback will mean more gets you more. And the classic examples for positive feedback are labor contractions. So the more the uterus contracts during childbirth, the more the uterus contracts. Um, the other thing is lactation. The more a woman breastfeeds, the more milk she's going to make. And it can just, it can go up and up and up and up. It's not like, oh, this baby is trying to eat too much. Let me reduce my milk production so this baby will stop eating so much. Doesn't work like that. Baby would not be happy. Nobody would be happy. Positive feedback is a, a survival uh, mechanism. Doesn't happen very often, but it is a more gets you more type of deal. So labor lactation, and then blood clotting is also a positive feedback. Um, anytime that you have a disease or anytime a, a patient has a disease, it has something to do with the homeostatic imbalance, and we're going to talk about lots of diseases in this class. All right, so this is showing you right here um, just another way. So this balance, this is homeostasis. This is just giving you a visual for what we already talked about. So you have a stimulus, some kind of change. A receptor is going to detect that change. The receptor is going to send a signal to the control center. So from receptor to control center is called the afferent pathway. Then the control center, the brain and the, and the brain stem and the spinal cord, is going to send out information on the efferent pathway to the effector. And the effector is what's going to give the response. So let me give you an example. Stimulus is cold it's cold okay so the stimulus is it's cold the receptor is a thermoreceptor on your skin the thermoreceptor on your skin senses it's too cold 
it sends that information down the afferent pathway to your brain. So through the nerves from your skin to your brain. Your brain then sends a, a signal down the efferent pathway to the effector. In this example, the effector would be your muscles. And your muscles are going to respond by contracting and making you shiver. And then you will balance back up by getting warmer. Um, the other examples here, and so this is the example that I just walked through. So I'm not gonna walk through that one again. This bottom was the one I just walked through with shivering. So you can read through that, just follow the arrows. On the flip side, a receptor on your skin is go or internally is going to sense that you're hot. It sends a signal down the afferent pathway to the brain. Hey, the body's getting too hot. The brain then says, hey, body, sweat. And your effector is gonna be your sweat glands. You're going to sweat. The sweat evaporates, taking heat with it, and then your body temperature falls. So. Um, Hopefully I didn't get way too fast through that, but that is, this is negative feedback right here. More gets you less, less gets you more. Positive feedback, here's our example. Um, if you have a, a blood, a bleed, break or tear in a blood vessel wall, platelets come in, platelets are gonna plug it, then platelets are gonna release chemicals that bring in more platelets. So the more platelets you have, the more platelets are gonna come in because if you have an injury, you can't have too many platelets unless they are forming in the wrong place at the wrong time and they end up causing something like an occlusion or a heart attack or something like that. All right, so that's positive and negative feedback. Um, please let me know, you know, make a star somewhere. Let me know if you have any questions over that. If you want a further explanation, I'm more than happy to go over that again during our Zoom call tomorrow before you take your quiz. So that's kind of the point of our Zoom call sometimes are to go over things before you take the little quiz to make sure you understand it. All right, we're gonna go over some anatomical terms some anatomical terms, and then um, and then we'll be done with um, this overview. I am not going to go over every single one of these words, but just so you know, um, we do not use common words to describe anatomy. Um, so instead of um, saying, uh, I'm just like, instead of saying like your breast plate or your breast bone, you would say sternal. Um, instead of even saying, um, trying to find one, instead of saying belly button, you would use the word umbilical. And I mean, you can, you can look through all of these. So there's, there's certain words that are used and we, in, in uh, everyday life, we use uh, common terms to describe the body, but there's some very specific terms that are used um, to describe the body in anatomy. And so you're just going to do a little drag and drop activity to help you practice this. You don't need to memorize it. I just want you to be exposed. And then later on, when you're taking anatomy in college or pre-med or in med school, even you can remember, oh, she has that drag and drop game. I wonder if that's still in existence. Let me dig out my anatomy manual and let me actually memorize these words. The drag and drop activity really helps you memorize all of these words right here. But um, we aren't going to get in too much into detail with these. I just want you to know that they exist. Okay. We also have directional terms. And I'm just going to give you the shortcuts here. So if you follow along, I'm just going to go through each word and I'm going to give you a, a little shortcut word to remember it. Superior means towards the head. Superior means towards the head. So I would underline that. Inferior means away from the head. Ventral, also known as anterior, because we have words for words, always. Ventral, also known as anterior, means front. Dorsal, also known as posterior, means back. So the, literally your ventral side is your front, where you're like your belly button and your chest and all that stuff would be. Your dorsal part of your body would literally just be your back. Okay? So I would just kind of highlight or underline the shortcut words for those. Medial just means midline. Your heart is medial to the arm, midline. Lateral means away from the midline. So lateral actually means side. The arms are lateral to the chest. The arms are to the side of the chest. And then intermediate means between medial and lateral. It's not completely in the middle, but it's not completely um, to the side. It's between something. So here's a really good example. Your collarbone is intermediate between the breastbone and the shoulder. 
You're like, there's such an e more easy way to say these things. Yes, there is, but this is what the scientific community and the medical community has decided we are going to say. All right, so this would be really important for someone who um, reads x-rays or performs surgeries or something like that. You're going to have to know these words then. All right, we got some more. These ones are a little bit more difficult. Proximal means it's closer to the body trunk. So here's the body trunk. And if you're comparing two things, the thing that is proximal is actually closer to the body trunk. So let me give you an example. The elbow is proximal to the wrist, meaning the elbow is closer to the body trunk than the wrist. Another one would be the shoulder is proximal to the elbow, meaning the shoulder is actually closer to the body trunk than the elbow. All right. Um, distal means further away, so it's the opposite. So you would just say it the opposite. The elbow is distal to the shoulder. The wrist is distal to the um, elbow. Okay. And like I said, this is really these are really important terms when physicians are describing things to each other um, when it comes to diagnoses or if they're reading x-rays or something like that. All right. Um, superficial means towards the outside of the body. All right. Like your skin. Your skin is superficial to your skeleton or your muscles. And then deep means away from the surface of the body. The lungs are deep to the skin. Okay, and so you're probably wondering when would they ever use these words when we'd ever. So let's say you have a, um, a doctor that has a patient and is trying to describe to another person where a brain aneurysm has occurred. Um, instead of saying it's the front of the brain, so the, the brain aneurysm has occurred towards the front of the brain, they would say the anterior part of the brain is where the aneurysm occurred. Um, they just choose not to use other words because you want to make sure you have very specific words so they couldn't be confused with anything else. That's the justification for it. All right. Uh, regional terms, axial is the main body part, so it's almost like the body trunk, it's the axial, head, neck, and trunk, so yeah, head, neck, and trunk, so this is actually the trunk right here, and then appendicular would be the limbs, okay, so axial and then appendicular. So these are all just descriptive words to um, just explain or describe where something is to make sure that everyone's on the same page when descriptions are given, especially in medicine. Okay, so let's talk about how the body can be cut. Okay, when you do dissections, the body can be cut in um, a few different ways, four different ways, all right? The first way is going to be the sagittal plane. And these are gonna be really hard to describe with me not actually being in front of you. I would actually have a person stand up and I would actually, um, yeah, do motions to help describe these things, but I'm, I'm going to really try here. So, um, and I think in our in our discussion tomorrow, I'm going to really do a demonstration to help you guys with this. So sagittal plane means that it's been cut into a left and right side. So if you can imagine, um, if you took your mouse or, you, it, you know, you took a cadaver and you cut it down the middle, down the breastbone, um, so that there's a left and a right side. So median or mid sagittal just means exactly down the middle. Parasagittal means there's still a left and right side, but it wasn't perfectly down the middle. All right, frontal or coronal plane is dividing into anterior and posterior. So if you can imagine a um, cadaver that has been cut so that the uh, front side stays intact and the back side stays intact, but they're separated from each other. I'm going to show you a picture in just a second that might help you out. Transverse means that it's divided into superior and inferior. So the organism is divided into a top or a bottom. And then oblique is just diagonal cuts. All right, so here is our um, picture to kind of help you out. So this is a uh, frontal, what, Frontal coronal plane. I'm sorry, these are out of order. So I apologize. We're looking at the second one here. Frontal coronal is going to divide into anterior and posterior. So do you see how it's this one? So she was cut 
this way through that way, you would have a front side and then you would have a back side. And this would be done to see those um, organs in this cavity in the, the middle here, this body trunk cavity right here. So you could do a cross section of the lungs, the spleen, the liver, the heart, super cool stuff. So really cool to see the inside of those. Right, a transverse horizontal. So it's this third one here. So transverse means dividing into superior and inferior. And it's going to be this one right here, just right down the middle there to where you have the top of the body as a piece and you have the bottom body of the body as a piece. It's hard to talk about this with humans, but this is done, especially if you're going to go to medical school, you're probably going to dissect humans. <laughs> All right, and then the median or sagittal, mid-sagittal. So this was a our first one, sagittal plane. So sagittal plane would be cutting the body into a left and a right side. All right, so I have a little exercise here for you. If you can pause the video and take a guess which cut, which cut is being shown below. And I'll just tell you right now, none of them are diagonal. They're all going to be either sagittal, frontal, or transverse. And so if you can look at each one of these pictures and try to write which one you think it is, and then I'll come back and I'll tell you which one it is. Okay, so hopefully you paused just now and you tried to do this on your own. Um, these are tough, these are hard. So if you don't get them right, don't, don't flip out. I'm not gonna ask you questions like this. It's pretty hard. I would just use a definition and maybe a picture with it. So with the kidneys, this one's a little bit difficult because in the human body, the kidneys are actually faced kind of towards the side. So if you actually cut a human to where the kidneys would look like this, this would actually be a frontal cut. Um, but you had to know the way that the kidneys lie um, in the body. But if you said sagittal on this one, I would agree it looks like a left and a right cut also. I would say this is the left side, this is the right side. But if you really looked at the human body and how the human body would have to be cut itself, it would probably fall under frontal. Some of these are up for debate. This next one is definitely not up for debate. This is showing you one side of the brain. So this is definitely a sagittal cut. It only shows you one side. So this brain was definitely cut into a left and a right side. It's okay if you got it wrong. Um, this is a thigh and you're like, wait, how does that, how does that even look like a thigh? So you would have to know that this middle thing right here is a bone. The red stuff is muscle and the yellow stuff is fat. So now you're like, oh, okay, I'm looking down at the thigh. So in order for you to even see this plane right here, it would have to be a cut that cuts the superior um, and inferior um, from each other. So this would be a transverse cut right here. All right, this next one is kind of weird. You're like, what am I looking at? RV, LV, what? Um, so I'm just gonna tell you, RV, LV means right ventricle, left ventricle. And so you're basically looking down into the heart. So if you're looking down into the heart, this one had to be a transverse cut. All right, this one you're looking at the chest, lungs, and heart, and it looks like the front side has kind of been sliced off. So this would definitely be one of the those um, frontal cuts. All right, a frontal cut. And then this one, this one had to be cut perfect down the middle so that you could see. So this is a person turned to the side and you can see inside of them from the side, kind of like this picture right here. So this would be a sagittal cut. All right, so just to go back over it, this one we're debating sagittal or frontal. This one's definitely sagittal. This one right here, the thigh is transverse. The heart is transverse. The chest is frontal and the head is a sagittal cut. Those are really tough to look at. Um, I definitely won't ask you questions on that because I would ask you, um, I would have you do like a practical if we were in the classroom and I would actually cut a brain and say, okay, which cut did I do? You would definitely be able to tell then. And then we have uh, body cavities, descriptions of body cavities. So the dorsal cavity, so this back one right here is going to involve the cranial and the uh, spine and the vertebrae. 
cranial cavity, the vertebrae, and the spine. And then the ventral body cavity is going to involve the lungs, heart, trachea, um, esophagus, and your abdomen. So you have a back dorsal cavity, and then you have a ventral cavity. So just so you know, that's a thing. All right. And so why do we need all of these terms? I think I said it earlier. Um, we need all these terms so that um, scientists and health professionals can communicate with each other and will not get confused because these terms are so specific. There is no way anyone could get confused because imagine if a common word was used and a surgeon did surgery on the wrong part of the body. This is to ensure that everybody knows what everyone else is talking about. And so I did go over 35 minutes and I apologize for um, going longer, but that's kind of how these things are gonna go. They'll probably hover around 35 minutes. I hope that you um, got a really good overview of all the anatomical terms, um, homeostasis, negative feedback, and the things that the human body needs for survival. And I will see you guys later. Let me know if you have any questions. All right, bye.